So welcome back for the final session today. We've had some rich conversations on a broad range of issues. We've had um, responses to our theme of access or control from practitioners as well as researchers from the academy. Some of the common th threads that have um, been talked about today are knowledge, access, trust, truth, untruth, custodianship and decolonisation. And these threads are likely to emerge in our final presentation for today. It's an absolute privilege to be welcoming Professor Marcia Langton. Her participation in today's program is proudly sponsored by Bibliotheca. Professor Langton AM is an anthropologist and geographer, and since 2000 has held the position of Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne. Professor Langton has received many awards in, her rec in recognition of her work in anthropology and the advocacy of Aboriginal rights. I would like to welcome Professor Langton to uh, give her address titled Libraries and Indigenous Knowledge, the Old and New Challenges. So over to you, Professor Langton. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Vicky. Uh, first, I acknowledge the traditional owners. Um, I'm here on Wurundjeri land in the land of the Kulin Nations and I honour their elders past and present and likewise for all the elders of the land, lands wherever you are. It's an honour to have this opportunity to speak to you about matters that I hold to be supremely important. Libraries and Indigenous knowledge. We face old and new challenges. In our book, Australian Indigenous Knowledge and Libraries, Professor Martin Nakater and I wrote, and I think this was back in 19, sorry, I think about 2004, uh, the first thing we would like readers to take away would be an appreciation and understanding of the complexities that library archives and information professionals must engage with in meeting the needs of Indigenous people and managing Indigenous knowledge within their organisations. The contributors to this book published in, I wasn't far wrong, 2005, discussed the ways that these needs could be met, many of them drawn from the new online and digital resources available. It was clear then that the clear and high standards of practice in this area rests on building a strong foundation for understanding what informs the concerns of Indigenous people about the intersection of our knowledge and cultural materials with library and archival systems and practice. What has changed? Well, many changes have occurred and these are very welcome, but there remains much to be done. What are the challenges now? Indigenous knowledge systems are being increasingly recognised in the academy and their place among the knowledge systems of the world recognised. Uh, you might have heard uh, that uh, last year, the University of Melbourne established the first Indigenous Knowledge Institute, um, and that is intended to be a global Indigenous Knowledge Institute. It's now up and running. Um, and if you want to ask me some questions about that later, I'd be very happy to answer. The literature on Indigenous societies in Australia is immense and dates to the first day that a British man set foot on our continent. Well, I wrote that some time ago, but I have to correct that. Actually, the written record uh, predates the British and uh, I refer to the, uh, the works of Macassan writers from... Uh, what is now Kalimantan uh, in Malaysia, uh, but that's another matter. And uh, one day I'll hopefully co-write a paper with a person who can actually read the Macassan and Dutch records. Um, but in any case, we're mostly familiar with the, the British records. And of course they were French records, but uh, they were lost at sea. Um, now, the question is, how can we mobilise this vast literary legacy to the task of enabling Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to access it easily and to contribute to it? I hope to answer some of these questions. 
you might have seen the first dog on the moon cartoon uh, last week pertaining to the uh, threat from Google to shut down uh, their news services in Australia because of new legislation that's being proposed to make them pay. Um, so first dog on the moon asked the question, how did we find things out before Google? Remember going to the library? Um, it's a wonderful little cartoon and uh, it's in my PowerPoint presentation and you might be able to see it um, when it's shared with you. But it isn't as yet as far as I can tell. But in any case, he also makes the interesting point uh, Remember encyclopedias, they were expensive and racist and immediately out of date. And I, I think he captured a, a very large part of the problem that we face. Uh, those of us who are concerned with uh, documenting, archiving and making accessible to new generations the enormous legacy of Indigenous knowledge uh, that has, has been recorded in all sorts of different ways. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so obviously the online environment, the web environment, is a critical part of the picture. But there is a, uh, an inequity. There are people who have computers and access to the internet and people who don't. And many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do not have access to the internet. Um, and, you know, the same goes for other Australians. Uh, we found out during the pandemic that there were many children who were suffering when uh, classes went online because they didn't have computers. So uh, this is a common problem. But... I want to remind you that most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander parents, grandparents and great-grandparents have a burning desire for their young people to learn in school about their cultures and achievements and feel proud of them. They want Australian children to know that contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are strong, resilient, rich and diverse. They want all Australian children to learn about our cultures, societies and history so that they go out into the world with the respect for the first peoples of Australia and everything they have achieved. Why should we learn about the history of human life and environments before the British arrived here in our country? The vast majority of human history on this continent is that of the first peoples who lived here before the British arrived. Their descendants, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of today, continue to maintain traditions and customs that make this place distinctive and unique. It is likely that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures are the oldest living cultures surviving in the same locations anywhere on the planet. My generation of Aboriginal people want young Australians to be taught more about our history and culture than what we were. I have met very few Australians in my generation or even among younger people who learned anything at all in school about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That wasn't a racist lie. Many people have told me that if they were taught anything about our peoples, it was not correct and often racist. In 2006, I wrote the prologue for First Australians, the companion book to the award-winning television series on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history, produced, written and directed by Rachel Perkins and on which I collaborated. I explained in the prologue how learning Australian history in school in Queensland more than 50 years ago was both painful and boring. I wrote, the occasional Aboriginal characters represented bore no resemblance to the people I knew and had grown up with. Gradually, there was a dawning realisation 
that I was seen by my teacher and classmates as one of those Aborigines. History was for me a terrible burden because it was in this class that I learned that people like me were hated and that the only stories that we were told about ourselves provided a steady stock of evidence about our supposedly shockingly violent tendencies, savagery, and most importantly, our innate tendency to steal and pilfer. Uh, when Rachel Perkins and I looked at how Australian history was taught in schools and universities in the past, we found that most textbooks made us disappear completely sometime in the 19th century, or if the writers of those books did say that there were a few survivors, they wrote about these Indigenous people in ways that were disrespectful and did not acknowledge our ancient and important history. Gradually, the attitude started to change as new historians began to write our history. If the idea of Australia is based only on what is known about the way that people lived, what they did and when, and how things changed since 1788, it is a meagre notion and representation of all of human history on this continent during an estimated minimum of 65,000 years since humans arrived here. With the growing respect for Indigenous knowledge and its presentation to audiences beyond the families, clans and languages and language groups that inherited these bodies of ancient knowledge, a very different picture of human life in Australia has emerged that departs radically from the ugly view of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as primitive, backward and unchanging. I want to turn to something else that I wrote much earlier on. And uh, I went looking for this, it's quite hard to find. Uh, as I was thinking about these problems. And uh, <clears throat> what I realised was that actually there hasn't been all that much change. Uh, I wrote in 1999, 22 years ago, in uh, an Academy of an Australian Academy of Humanities book, First People's Second Chance. It is the great paradox of the Australian humanities that while our literary and intellectual traditions are mimetic, aspiring to the grand traditions of the North, the literati of the imperial centre have prized above everything else coming from this continent the ethnological observations, ideas and notions about Australia's despised Indigenous people. Of course, the means for inscribing Aboriginal studies came with the first fleet. I cannot argue, but remember this was 1999, that there is a written scholarship of Indigenous Australia that does not have its source in the Western history of ideas. Among the most consistently prized intellectual exports have been observations of the life of Australian Aborigines, valued not so much for their intellectual weight, but because they were taken as empirical support for ideas developed in the great centres about the physical evolution of humanity, the origins of human institutions, the nature of the human condition, of the loss of in innocence and wisdom in the civilised world, qualities which Indigenous societies were purported to retain. And, you know, it was a worldwide phenomenon. Remember Lewis Henry Morgan on the United States of America and his uh, writings on the origins of marriage adopted by Lenin and Marx and Stalin and the world of anthropology. Emile Durkheim in 1915 speculated on Aboriginal religious forms and that too has informed sociology, anthropology, history. Of course, he'd never been to Australia, but that's irrelevant in their world. Marcel Moss, Levi Brühl, Roheim, Levi Strauss. Um, But what we don't learn from these works is that the early ethnologists reported home from a world of violence, 
They documented, according to the ideas of their time, the diverse forms of human social organisation on this continent in the early colonial period, writing against a secret and not so secret effort to annihilate the people of the land. Were they utterly naive or willfully deceptive? Those who wrote, the native races mysteriously disappear at the arrival of the white man. Uh, and so I go on, so I refer you to certainty and uncertainty, in which I outline how racial theories and eugenicism, eugenicism were major intellectual exports of Australia and curiously, uh, described a mythology, a fantasy. But the real change has been not that that literature has slipped from the Australian imagination, but rather that thousands of writers have stepped into the breach, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to correct that terrible colonial legacy of Australian literature. There are thousands of cultural resources that are evidence of this aspiration for greater awareness and understanding of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And for teachers, the people who teach our children what they need to know to be competent citizens of the globe, and these are the people I maintain a great concern for, are confused and befuddled about which resources to use. There are countless teacher resources made about Indigenous people with little to no input from Indigenous people. And as such, as it is important for educators and students to have sufficient tools and knowledge to ensure that all resources are both accurate and appropriate. Uh, in order to address this problem, I responded to a request from a former Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Nigel Scullion, and managed uh, to create a a curriculum, an online curricular project. And uh, I'd love to be able to share that with you. So uh, perhaps I might share my screen in order to be able to do that. Now I can't. Uh, so, This project is called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Curricular Project. And uh, it's online uh, at the University of Melbourne, easy to find. And on it so far, we have 42 resources for teachers that are <clears throat> incorporate Indigenous knowledge under three themes into refined teacher resources under each of the learning areas. And so the three themes of Indigenous knowledge that we use are astronomy, fire and water, because these are relatively non-contentious and don't frighten people, uh, as does the truth of our history. So, for example, uh, in each of these uh, themes, you can turn to an area, a learning area, and you'll find uh, a refined curriculum resource which presents to teachers on a platter all that they need to know to ch teach in this instance in English grade five about law, song and a Merriam moon dance. And this uh, provides them with 
resources from Indigenous knowledge holders and experts, uh, classroom activities, all the curriculum connections as per the Australian curriculum, um, the achievement standards, inquiry-based learning questions, activities about the moon dance, um, and resources are provided. As it stands at the moment, even while Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures are um, or are represented as a cross-curriculum pr priority, one of three in the Australian curriculum, it is only this cross-curriculum pr priority that is not taught. So my dear friend and colleague, Dr Melita Hogarth and I, intend to correct this problem by... Um, trialling our resources, these 42 that I've just mentioned, as well as more that, are, that will be developed in classrooms as soon as classrooms are open for people like ourselves um, to enter classrooms. Um, of course, our phase two of this project is delayed by the pandemic restrictions. But what we want to do is make sure that teachers overcome their fears in order to teach Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures without fear, fear of being racist, fear of having the wrong resources, fear of saying the wrong thing, because we've done the work for them. And also, like everybody else, they are highly reliant on online resources. And how are they to know if a resource is reliable or not? They can't know because they're not Indigenous studies or Indigenous knowledge experts. Some of them are, of course, but that's merely accidental or coincidental. And so <clears throat> I'd just like to introduce you to Melita um, in her absence. Um, Melita is a Wiradjuri woman who's uh, commenced at the University of Melbourne, I think about two years ago. She's very much involved uh, in her um, faculty in the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. She's a highly experienced teacher, uh, but she has a PhD in education. As soon as she arrived, I was fascinated because her work is wonderful. And uh, I've asked her to be the research director of this project. And she's already made an enormous contribution. So we're working together to bring about phase two of this project. And that is to ensure that our work is um, implemented in classrooms. Now, <clears throat> I know that teachers do try, but, um, or some teachers do try, and some schools do try, but here's the problem. Asking an Aboriginal person to do a welcome to country or to speak on um, NAIDOC, in NAIDOC week uh, or, in other, or at other important events at the school, does not constitute curriculum. That is not curriculum. We want to make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures are presented to students in a systematic curriculum, not as a casual add-on or an event. And uh, a speech or a didgeridoo performance is not a substitute for curriculum. Now, 
I think it's highly likely that very few teachers know why we say that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, well, Aboriginal cultures are the oldest on the planet, oldest continuing on the planet with a history of at least 65,000 years. No, they wouldn't know about the work of the archaeologists, Clarkson and his uh, esteemed team of archaeologists um, and their um, discoveries at Mudjid Bibi in Arnhem Land, nor would they know about the work of uh, Emeritus Professor Jim Bowman, who's worked with another team down here in Victoria near Warrnambool, where they suspect that people were living 120,000 years ago. They haven't proved it yet. Nor do I imagine for a minute that most teachers understand from the enormous literature that I've mentioned that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people produced food uh, not only by hunting and gathering, but also with unique agricultural and aquaculture methods. They created material culture and toolkits that were ingenious and appropriate to their lifestyles and environments. That they managed the land on a continent-wide scale through ch changes in climate and geography, including an ice age and significant sea level changes, and developed artistic and design traditions and legal, religious and social institutions of great subtlety and beauty. There are extensive trade routes that crisscross the country, some still used today. The evidence of this is all around us today and much of it is still practised and preserved and increasingly better understood. Books, films, documentaries, art exhibitions, cultural festivals, musical, theatrical and dance performances libraries and the ongoing ceremonial and ritual activities in our societies have made this available to a global audience. And yet it is not systematically taught in our schools. As questions about the sustainability of human systems and natural environments become the key challenges globally, the realization has dawned on environmental thinkers that indigenous populations lived in parts of this continent adapting and innovating as they witnessed an ice age, the disappearance of the megafauna, the rising of the seas, the drying up of the continent, and maintain knowledge traditions, philosophies and epistemologies that originated in ancient Australia, many of which continue today, transmitted from generation to generation, and all highly relevant to the challenges humanity faces today during the climate crisis. And yet our children do not come home from school with this understanding. And our teachers do not know about the literature, the science and the humanities that have contributed to these understandings. And they are not trained to undertake uh, the research required to teach all of this accurately, hence our project. And also our plan to provide education to teachers under the AITSL's professional standards 1.4 and 2.4 to increase their efficacy in teaching Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. It is simply astonishing how much Indigenous knowledge has survived despite the terrible history. As scientists and researchers have come into contact with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are knowledgeable about uh, and practice these ancient traditions, often involving them in research projects, there have been more and there has been more and more recognition of the verifiability of these knowledge traditions and greater respect for knowledgeable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who manage land and water. Uh, I could refer you to just three experts, uh, Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, who's also Wiradjuri like Melita. Uh, he gave the Nam oration 
last year at the University of Melbourne. It's available online. Uh, uh, Dr. Brad Mogridge of the Canberra University, who's an expert on water and Indigenous knowledge, and a non-Indigenous people hailing from, I believe, Ohio in the United States of America, Dr. Dwayne Hummaker, who's an astronomer documenting Indigenous uh, astronomy. And I've turned to these three experts and many others and Indigenous knowledge holders uh, to present a different view to teachers of how to uh, manage the curriculum challenges that they face. And I believe that these challenges are relevant to many other Australians as well, not just teachers. The same criticisms that I make of the failure to implement the curriculum on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples could be levelled at the media or politicians um, or policy makers. Uh, and uh, the list would go on. I should include medical practitioners. So uh, I want to leave time for you to ask questions, but I think that there are a few points I need to make. Now, I've made this point about uh, our children, but particularly Indigenous children. This is one of the goals of uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and culture uh, or history and cultures cross-curriculum priority. That Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students are able to see themselves, their identities and their cultures reflected in the curriculum of each of the learning areas can fully participate in the curriculum and can build their self-esteem. In other words, not have the horrible experience that I had and every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person had if they're in my age group when they went to school. Of coming to the conclusion, the inescapable conclusion at a very young age that we were despised and hated and so too our cultural traditions. And secondly, that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures cross-curriculum priority is designed for all students to engage in reconciliation, respect and recognition of the world's oldest continuing living cultures. So as I say, we develop these resources to empower all teachers to integrate our perspectives into their classroom practice. But they're more than perspectives. As I say, the word perspectives is used by ACARA, the curriculum authority. But these are more than perspectives. These are bodies of knowledge. These are epistemologies and philosophies. And they ought to be taken seriously. And I'm very proud to work at the University of Melbourne where this is recognised with the establishment of the Indigenous Knowledges Institute. The goal is to ensure that all Australian students have the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the depth, wealth and diversity of our histories and cultures. Um, so we've jo been joined also by the Dean of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, Professor Jim Waterston, in implementing the new phase of our project. We want to enable documentation and greater recognition of Indigenous knowledges through research and scholarship in collaboration with Indigenous knowledge custodians and communities. And clearly we will need the assistance of libraries, including those, and especially those, those, those libraries that have um, online catalogues um, and digital repositories. Um, and obviously that's the case with the, Abri uh, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Histories, uh, sorry, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies in Canberra. But I, I, I notice increasingly in my travels that small libraries across Australia might have a special presentation during NAIDOC week 
and indeed have, you know, small but hugely valuable um, little keeping places for Indigenous knowledge. And I, I love the work of the State Library of Queensland in that regard and also the Mitchell Library. Um, we also have the goal of supporting the development and implementation of a comprehensive program of school curriculum resources, as I explained earlier. We want to enable state and federal education departments and the independent school sector and university partners to build national curriculum for primary and secondary education outcomes facilitate education reform that sees Indigenous knowledge curriculum built into teacher accreditation requirements in each state and territory, and provide models that will assist Australian universities to build Indigenous knowledge, knowledge's curriculum into teacher education programs, including professional development of in-service teachers. And so I invite you to be involved. Your work as librarians and archivists will be invaluable and critical to our success. And so what we are deeply concerned about is developing an inspiring, accredited and evidence-based program for giving voice to Indigenous knowledge and growing positive working relationships with Indigenous communities with the aim ultimately of improving Indigenous student and community engagement across government and independent schools. One of the great challenges is the linguistic diversity of Indigenous Australia. And current estimates vary, but uh, I'm informed by experts such as Professor Rachel Nordlinger at our research unit in Indigenous languages, uh, that the general agreement is that there are more than 600 distinct language varieties and 250 or more languages. Australian languages, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, many of them completely different from one another. However, only 13 of them are taught in the way that languages have been taught throughout human history, uh, usually from mother to child and then through socialisation in a language group. Only 13 out of the 600 language varieties. So you can see that the urgency that Professor Martin Nakata and I wrote about in 2005 has accelerated. And like the climate crisis, the language and culture crisis facing our people is more extreme than ever. And hence we are driven to undertake these programs. Um, did you know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people paid careful attention to unexpected phenomena such as eclipses and meteorite impacts and could determine the cardinal points to an accuracy of a few degrees? Did you know that Aboriginal Australians discovered the variability of beetle geese or beetle juice and made observations of red giant variable stars? My colleague Dwayne Hummaker and his uh, colleague Ray Norris have led research to document how the traditional cultures of Aboriginal Australians include a significant astronomical component perpetuated through oral tradition, ceremony and art. Wouldn't you love for young Australians to know about this? Well, I do, and I think many of you do too. So uh, in the hope that I will leave some time for you to ask questions, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, it's been an absolute delight to be able to speak to you today about my concerns and to be able to invite you to take part in our work. Um, and in the coming months, we'll be able to inform you of how you might be able to assist. Now, I know that there are many Indigenous people undertaking projects like this. And one thing we would love to achieve in the end is a kind of ranking system, um, a star system, if you like, to make it easy not only for teachers and parents, but also librarians to understand 
what experts and Indigenous knowledge holders deem to be a uh, reputable work and a reliable work rather than the uh, fake news and awful, often dreadful and disgusting racism that so many Australians rely on when they read Facebook. So, uh, or, or indeed, some of the records from our colonial history. I know that you are the keepers of our intellectual tradition. And so I thank you for listening to me and once again, invite you to be involved. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Langton, for your address. And I can tell you just from listening to, well, watching rather the chat and the discussion, there's a lot of interest from our sector to be involved and to work with you. And, uh, and also um, a lot of interest in the links that you've shared around the curriculum resources. Um, a couple of the common themes that are coming through in the questions is really your thoughts and suggestions on what we can do as custodians of, of many collections to actually increase understanding of the rich culture and history of our Aboriginal, um, of our Aboriginal culture. Um, is, is it, would you like to just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, great question. Uh, I'm not, and and it's, it's a big question and I'm not sure where to start, but mm -hmm. let me first of all start by saying, well, I used to work in a library. Um, a good part of my first degree was paid for by the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Uh, when I worked in the library, they gave me time off to study. And I was an assistant bibliographer. And I know how important catalogues are. Now, there's, we all know that there are hundreds of collections that have not been catalogued. Um, and they're sitting in boxes in archives. So, uh, there's a great challenge. What do we do about that? Well, we can do a number of things. We need to train people. Well, to first of all, get them into the, to get them catalogued and hopefully digitized. Now, people say, oh, it will cost so much money. You know, it doesn't actually cost all that much money anymore. You can buy a, uh, you know, what do you call one of those machines? A scanner. A scanner, less than $200 at Officeworks now. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a problem that we need to turn our attention to. But what we need to do also is make sure that Indigenous people are being properly trained to work in libraries and archives with uh, the correct qualifications, not like me in the old days, assistant bibliographer. Um, I did the work that everybody else did but I was never encouraged, you know, to become a professional, although eventually the library did employ Aboriginal professionals in the field. And I think that's enormously important. And I've been to quite a few uh, conferences of, uh, of archivists in particular, and I, I very much admire their work. And they're, they're critical to our work. So, uh, of course, I'm sure many of you have read Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu. Well, he's, he shows, you know, so elegantly what the problem is. It was always there in the archives, but historians ignored it. He didn't. And, he and, and there was a lot of comments in our threads around Bruce Pascoe and I guess just the, re the revelations that he brings. And I guess um, I know that when we've had Bruce Pascoe speak here at the State Library of Queensland, the response from everyone is, but we never knew this and, you know, the, the shock of that. Um, and thank you for raising uh, the comments around uh, the cataloguing and metadata. We actually had a discussion about that earlier today um, uh, with uh, Rose Barrowcliffe, um, Kirsten Thorpe and uh, Nathan Sentence. And, uh, and that was certainly something that there was a lot of interest in. And I'm sure it will also come up later in the week. We have some perspective sessions, uh, particularly for the National and State Libraries. And I know that they're doing a lot of work around ensuring that uh, appropriate metadata is used. Unfortunately, um, Professor Langton, we are out of time. Um, there was a little glitch with your slides, but we will ensure that they're shared with all the delegates and we'll also make your presentation available 
on the website following the conference. And we've also had a scribe recording your presentation as well. So I thank you very much. Um, your presentation was one that we are really thrilled to include in our program. And I know the delegates very much valued the opportunity to hear you speak to us today. So thank you very much for joining us. A great honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.